Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, dear friends, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to the first event in Sidra Symposia series. Representing the vision of Her Highness Sheikh Al Moza bin Nasser, the chairman of Sidra. Sidra Medical and Research Center will bring a new level of health care to women and children both in Qatar and the region. The state-of-the-art facility currently under construction at the Education City will set a benchmark for learning, discovery, and exceptional patient care. The symposia series will provide a platform where experts from, ex from across the women and children healthcare sector can share best practice and new findings and engage with those interested to hear more. Let me now introduce to you our moderator, a handsome, <laughs> nice personality, <laughs> Dr. Yakum, who, who, who he is our medical advisor and head of medical staff services. Dr. Yakum Dudenhausen, with an impressive career, spending more than 30 years experience across Europe, United States, and the Middle East. He brought significant expertise in the field of human health to our session today and will provide you with some more information on SIDRA, this series, and the topic we are going to discuss today. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, welcome to the symposium uh, about obesity in pregnancy and childhood. This session today focused on obesity in pregnancy and childhood and will address how, why and who is affects in, it in the community and the region and the world. This is a very important uh, part for medicine and for Qatar and we have to realize that uh, two 0.8 million people die each year due to, due, uh, be, uh, due overweight and uh, obese. The same situation is in Middle East. And Qatar ranks in the sixth in obesity prevalence uh, globally with the highest rate of obese young boys regularly. 32% of males and 39% of females in Qatar are obese. These uh, numbers are the reason for us to speak about this problem from medical and from social point or psychological point of view. And all these uh, uh, metabolic diseases from people with 50 and 60 are starting in pregnancy. And that's an important point to know, and uh, there's starting the, the prevention, there has to be starting the prevention. Therefore, I'm very happy to uh, introduce to you Dr. Taubel from uh, the Weill Cornell Medical College, New York. She's obstetrician and gynecologist there, and is, she is working uh, in research about uh, obesity and diabetes. And therefore, she will, she will speak about obesity your pregnancy, that's your floor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dudenhausen, and, and thank you all for being here. Good evening. The topic I would like to present this evening is about obesity and pregnancy. And to understand some of it, I'm going to give you a couple of basic definitions. Some of these are compiled by the National Institutes of Health, the Institute of Medicine, and various other organizations. But in general, it's a state of excess adipose tissue mass. And we have different measures of criteria, different methods of determining whether a person is obese or not, um, and, or on the way to being obese in the overweight state. We can calculate a person's BMI. We can do skin fold thickness, which is called anthropometry. We can do densitometry, which is where we weigh someone underwater. We can do imaging, either a CAT scan or an MRI. Or we can do electrical impedance testing. By far, the easiest one is a BMI. And in most uh, medical centers, especially where there is an uh, electronic medical record, this is usually calculated for you once you take vital signs. It stands for body mass index. And it is the person's uh, weight uh, divided by their, what we estimate to be, their, the metered square area of their skin. 
a normal BMI, both male and female, is, is considered 18 and a half to almost 30 kilograms per meter squared. Overweight is from 25 to 29.9, and obese is a BMI of 30 or higher. And unfortunately, in this day and age, we actually have to classify that even further to be a class one obese, class two, or class three. And um, if you look at the data worldwide, the class three category has been ga gaining in numbers steadily over the last 20 years. Some of you may recognize this. This is one of the ways we can calculate it very quick and easy. Um, however, there are many other different methods you could use. Uh, but you can see how this range can vary based on height and weight. So the problems associated with obesity. Originally, when I went to medical school 20 years ago, a lot of the concern was it's, it's due to excess weight being carried by the body and the strain that this caused. So we think that the heart works harder, the pulmonary system works harder, it's harder to get oxygen delivered to all the tissues because there's extra tissue. The internal organs are compressed and joints and muscles work harder. And that is true. At any stage in life, all of these things come into play when you're working with someone who is overweight or obese. But that's not the only thing, okay? We know that there is a definite relationship between obesity and insulin resistance. And insulin resistance can lead to diabetes. Adipose tissue has characteristics that function like an endocrine gland. And once you have excess adipose tissue, those effects are even enhanced more. And because of this, obesity is now considered a chronic inflammatory state with consequences in many organ systems unrelated to the weight you carry. So it's not just the wear and tear of the extra weight on the body, it's other factors also. How does this happen? Well, we see many common symptoms seen in many obese adults, both men and women. And one of the things we see commonly is the metabolic syndrome, which is a combination of hypertension, dyslipidemia, central obesity, and increased fast fasting glucose. And this increased fasting glucose can actually lead to diabetes. So how do we go from being overweight or obese to inflammation? Where is that connection made? And this was a, something that had been discussed many times over in many different papers, and we think this is probably how it actually arises. The chronic hyperglycemic state, when you overeat, desensitizes all tissues to insulin, whether it's you know, the blood vessels or your muscles or other organs, and it allows for the development of excess uh, adipose tissue. The adipose cells, once they're dysregulated, now release inflammatory mediators. And these inflammatory mediators act all over the body. They're transported everywhere. One of the big consequences is the vasoreactivity that gets desensitized with this inflammatory mediator release, okay? And that then leads to endothelial dysfunction, which is how we get hypertension and vessel disease with people who are overweight and obese. The, um, the inflammatory mediators also decrease further responses to insulin, meaning the body has to make more insulin to get the desired result. And eventually, when that doesn't work, you will end up being diabetic. And they also circulate to other organs to decrease function. The GI tract, the heart, the brain, the skin, the muscle. So now we move on to pregnancy. How does this relate to pregnancy and how, how, what can we do about this and what do we see? We know that many obese women have associated decreased fertility. In light of any other medical problems, they still do not have the fertility profile at any age compared to a normal weight person. And it's probably due to the inflammatory mediators that are circulating. Even with assisted reproduction, we do not see the pregnancy outcomes that we would expect at any age in an obese female. And we know that obesity is strongly associated with first trimester loss. Have we actually made all the dots in a row to connect obesity and in the inflammatory state to first trimester loss? No. But when we see the type of problems we have, we make the connection that this is probably related. In pregnancy, we have strict recommendations on how much weight to gain. And the recommendations for a normal weight mother, someone who is of normal weight, so BMI less than 25, is 11.5 to 16 kilograms. The overweight mother, 7 to 11.5 kilograms, and obese mother, 5 to 9.1 kilograms. And for those of you who take care of obese mothers, how realistic is this? Women really feel that they can eat what they want when they're pregnant. They're eating for two, right? So what they do is they eat for two, which is not the concept that we want to present to them. They really don't need all that weight. 
they have extra weight on them, you just need to sustain the pregnancy. Unfortunately, not only do women gain this excess of this amount, they gain it early in pregnancy, which is much harder to lose. Because in early pregnancy, in the first trimester, you know it's not the baby that's taking all this weight. We do know that mothers who gain more weight than the recommended amount tend to retain the weight postpartum. If they're normal weight, 40% of them retain the weight a year postpartum, but 60% of overweight and obese mothers retain that weight postpartum. And if that happens in their first pregnancy, you can imagine how the snowball effect can affect them later on in life after the second, third, and fourth children if that happens. We also know that there is increased maternal morbidity in obese gravitas. We study after study over the last 25 to 30 years show that we have increased rates of pregnancy complications as the weight is higher, um, the pre-pregnancy weight is higher in the mom. Gestational diabetes and florid diabetes, regular diabetes, is, um, is a problem. Preeclampsia, and that's probably related to the vascular issues associated with the inflammatory state. Postpartum hemorrhage, macrosomia, stillbirth, and there are many studies about stillbirths in the obese uh, gravita showing that even if all of the factors were taken away, there is still a higher rate of stillbirth, some of them as high as three times the baseline. And as the BMI increases, this risk increases. On the baby, you see, you see also some deleterious effects. Increased risk of stillbirth, as I just mentioned. Increased risk of neural tube defects. And that leads us to think about this multifactorial inheritance or multifactorial consequence of, uh, that ends up being a neural tube defect. It's not just genetics. So what else can it be? But the inflammatory state of the mother can lead to this. Increased risk of heart defects of all kinds, increased risk of umbalacele, increased risk of IUGR, and that may be related to hypertensive or a prehypertensive state, and increased risk of macrosomia. Related to gestational diabetes, but even removing that as a risk, you still have an increased risk of macrosomia. When we deliver these patients, we have to be very careful on how we plan for it. Obesity alone is a risk factor for cesarean section. Over 50% of morbidly obese, in other words, BMI over 40, over 50% of those women will end up with a cesarean section, whether planned or unplanned. It's difficult to monitor the fetus, both intrapartum with the fetal monitors and antepartum doing sonograms. Exams can be difficult. There's increased risk for surgical complications and increased risk for anesthesia complications. In the peripartum state, other complications. Just by size alone, it's difficult to get an IV. Sometimes it's, you have inaccurate blood pressure monitoring. Prolonged cesarean section time. Uh, from someone who does surgical deliveries, to do a stat section or emergency section on an obese woman is a very large challenge. Uh, it, it, it takes much longer than you would like to, and if they've had a previous cesarean section and there are adhesions present, it can be very, very difficult. Uh, there's a poor operative field with poor visualization. There's an increased risk of hemorrhage, increased risk of thromboembolic event, events surrounding the delivery, increased risk of infection, and increased risk of shoulder dystocia. Over the last 10 years, we've seen an increase in weight reduction surgery, and those are things like gastric bands and gastroplasty and the, gas the traditional gastric bypass, the Rouen-E uh, procedure. And we see more and more women at younger ages going to have this done. Um, some people really feel that surgical procedures like this, if you have a complication due to obesity, this can be a good first-line treatment. There's a few limited studies on this um, because most patients do delay the surgery until after childbearing. However, the studies that have been published show that there is a big, better pregnancy outcome after the surgery. Um, the biggest challenge is to monitor for nutritional deficiencies and also to monitor as mom's weight gain because, again, when they're pregnant, they shouldn't be eating everything they can. You really still have to monitor them uh, well for that. And patients should wait 12 to 18 months after the surgery to conceive. So it is possible to have a healthy pregnancy after a gastric bypass or a weight-related uh, surgery, but we just have to monitor the, the mothers carefully. Why is this important? Besides the obesity epidemic and everything that comes with it, like I showed you in the first bunch of slides, we now think that there is probably something in mom's environment, in, in the prenatal environment, that may lead to future complications on the baby. In other words, when we cut the cord, that's not it. Okay, it's not that the baby is freed of all of mother's influence. We still have things to worry about. We know that obese moms have obese children. And we used to think, oh, it's because, you know, poor diet and poor exercise, and that then leads to, 
you know, poor nutrition and health habits on the child. But now we think it's probably a combination of more than just bad habits and bad teaching, that there is something in the prenatal environment that then gives the baby and then the child and the adult a predisposition to further health problems. A new term has come up called fetal programming or the, uh, the development hypothesis. We think that the fetal environment may set the stage for the individual's lifetime. And we used to, you know, think genetics, DNA, mom gives half, dad gives half, that's what the baby has, and that is true. But we also know that the gene products, the proteins that are made from this DNA, can be modified after the translated process is done with histones and methylation. And maybe that influence on, from the mother, from the environment that the mother gives the baby, then alters those gene products to then have an effect on the child later on. Um, and that's called epigenetics. So is it an epigenetic model of change? It could be. There's also the theory of mitochondrial DNA. All mitochondrial DNA comes from the mother, not from the father. And we know that mitochondrial DNA does have an influence on assisted reproduction. Women who have decreased or poor numbers of mitochondria do not have success with in vitro fertilization. So could this also be a key in letting us know what happens to the children later on since they're getting the mitochondrial DNA just from mother? We know that the fetus is exposed to the general inflammatory state of the obese mother during the entire pregnancy. Does this alter the fetal response to stimuli in postnatal life? And can that be changed? We don't know. Um, and we, but we do think it may influence both the birth phenotype and that will then lead to an altered adult phenotype. And here's a little diagram of what we think might happen. The developmental origins of disease. Um, there's many papers, not just on obesity, but on other things also, where the mother's environment, the prenatal environment set by mom, then influences the child later on. The, we think that neuroendocrine pathways are set um, in the fetus in response to what it experiences before it's born. They're usually finalized by postnatal life, and this then can predispose it to different diseases later in life. Um, we do know that exposure to the fetus to uncontrolled gestational diabetes risk increases the risk of childhood and adult obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Low birth weight children who are kind of told to catch up on growth later on when, they, when they're born tend to have an increased risk of adult obesity. So that nutritional balance, which is altered in the prenatal and the postnatal life, may have an influence. Um, but we do know that treatment of gestational diabetes decreases the risk of a newborn ob obesity. Um, does that contribute to the future maintenance of normal weight? We don't know. Okay. We also know that fetal programming may extend to other areas of fetal and newborn development. Things like exposure to toxins and environmental agents, things like addictive behavior, behaviors, especially alcoholism, and some psychiatric illnesses also may have this imprinting or programming done in the prenatal arena well before this child ever experiences or exhibits any of the uh, signs. And here is a list of my references, and I thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Bauer, for this excellent uh, overview. Uh, the floor is open for discussion for some questions. Do we have uh, questions now? Um, I think you, uh, I will start to, uh, I hope you will follow me with questions. Um, you spoke about the fetal programming and the uh, influence of gestational diabetes. And therefore, I think the uh, screening for gestational diabetes is an important point against obesity, against the metabolic syndrome. What is the optimal time in pregnancy to do it? Currently, ACON, the American Congress of OBGYN, recommends screening in the early third trimester, somewhere between 26 to 28 weeks. However, there is growing concern that we are missing people who might be diabetic, um, and they would like a general screening of everyone with a three-hour tolerance test, as opposed to the one-hour tolerance. Um, that has not been accepted yet as common practice, but we're giving it, uh, we're offering that more and more to patients who might be at risk. Yeah. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Is this on? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm interested in uh, childhood obesity, and uh, I do statistics and uh, epidemiology now, but originally I was a physicist, and a very famous physicist once said that you don't really understand a problem until you've measured it. Now, I appreciate that you began your talk by talking about ways to try and quantify um, 
obesity. And I, I find that very interesting the way you put that together. But, but um, my, my question really is, do you think that there have been sufficient uh, measurements, or in other words, uh, well-powered, well-designed epidemiological studies in Qatar and perhaps the eastern province of Saudi that would justify our ability to, to use uh, diagnostic thresholds based on that data? In other words, uh, it, do you think that, uh, that, that, that it's easy or straightforward to simply transport Western diagnostic thresholds to the local community as we stand right now, or, or is there a need for perhaps some cohort studies to, to establish local standards? There can be variations depending on patient's ethnicity and background. Certainly we see that when we have, you know, deliveries of patients of different ethnicities of what, you know, we say, oh, 10 pound baby can never be delivered and they can be depending on the patient's pelvis, etc. And I'm sure that things can vary. However, you need to also take into account what would be the, you know, if you, if you did statistics, you know, the bell-shaped curve, where patients have the most complications from insulin resistance, gestational diabetes, et cetera, et cetera, and that would then be the threshold in that population. I don't think anybody has ever done that yet, and I think it requires a lot of work to do it, and especially, you know, in this century where so many ethnicities and nationalities are now intercrossed, you don't have, very few families are of pure generations. Um, that may confound some of the findings you get. Thank you very much you. for your contribution and this interesting data which you gave us. And now we came to the, uh, uh, the time period of childhood and the obesity in childhood. And I'm very happy to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Ahmed El Ara. He is acting consultant pediatric endocrinology and diabetes in the Hamad Medical Corporation. And he's instructor in clinical pediatrics in Y Cornell Medical College in Qatar. And he will give us his uh, experience in childhood obesity, I'm happy to hear. That's your fault. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, uh, share in this uh, nice uh, first symposium for CEDRA. And uh, it's a challenging, uh, rather than, more than challenging to treat uh, diabetes in childhood, to uh, uh, make an overview for childhood diabetes in 10 minutes. So I try my best to make uh, a comprehensive uh, overview. Actually, um, by the end of this lecture, I hope that uh, we cover the magnitude of the problem globally and in Qatar, the definitions and classifications used in children rather than in adulthood, etiology for the simple obesity and other rare causes of obesity away from uh, simple obesity, health consequences, psychological consequences from ch in the childhood obesity and its relation to type 2 diabetes, and finally, the prevention and management plan for childhood obesity. Um, childhood obesity is a, a very serious public health challenge uh, in the uh, last WHO report. And uh, the most important, it's persistence into adulthood. And the longer the duration and the late the start of the obesity in childhood, the more likelihood to persist into the adulthood. And actually, its persistence in the adulthood will lead to earlier comorbidities like cardiovascular and diabetes mellitus. And uh, the prevalence of obesity has been tripled in the last decade or 20 years. And this illustration, one of the contributing factor for the environmental changes that contributed to the increase in the prevalence of uh, obesity. In Qatar, Penar et al. Uh, conducted a study on 2006 and found overweight and obesity in adolescent boys almost more than 35 percent and overweight and obesity in adolescent girls more than 23 percent and in other study regarding the food habits and unhealthy food habits in Qatar as well they found more than 33 percent skip breakfast and more than 66 percent of the children will have more than two times fast food per week and even more, I, we know that, and uh, unhealthy snacks. So the magnitude is very huge and uh, uh, globally and in Qatar. What's obesity? Obesity is simply excess of fat, but how can we calculate or estimate this excess of fat? There is no a cut off 
point, but we have methods. We have research methods. We don't apply in the daily clinical life, like the underwater weighing and MRI and imaging. But we use the clinical ways, our clinical methods, which are not that accurate like the research ways, but they are satisfactory. And we globally use the body mass index in the new definitions and the classifications. And other, other methods like waist circumference, sink fold thickness could be used, but not uh, in the definition and classification. So the BMI, the uh, normative value for the BMI is uh, highly age dependent. And uh, in adults, we have fixed figures for all ages and for both six. But in children, we cannot because the child has the same degree of adiposity at lower levels of BMI. So I should uh, declare this child as an obese at lower BMI. That's why in children, we use the percentile. We use a BMI percentile in the CDC, they diagnosed or defined overweight above the 95th percentile and risk for overweight above the 85th percentile of BMI for age and sex. And for the European, they use the 85th percentile to define overweight and 95th percentile to define obesity. And even we might use the 99th percentile to define severe obesity or morbid obesity. And recently, the WHO uh, defines the BMI based in, in, in the Z-score as a standard deviation. So overweight should be one standard deviation up to two standard deviation, and more than two standard deviation BMI should be obese. So this classification is very important, and we should calculate the BMI from the uh, formula we know, weight in kilogram divided on the height in meter squared, and then you plot the BMI, or you can calculate it from uh, uh, these charts, and then you should plot the BMI on the percentile. And here you should uh, uh, know that maybe at the same level, at the same level, at younger age, the same figure will be obese, but an older age will be at the healthy side. So the percentile is very important for children. What is the etiology? Here I'm talking about simple obesity, because more, th more than 95% of the obesity is simple and only 5% might be syndromic or endocrine. Endocrine causes like Cushing syndrome or, or uh, hypothyroidism, syndromes like Bradawelli syndrome or pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, but the main core is the simple obesity. It's a matter of interaction between a genetic background and environmental factors or triggers. The genetic backgrounds will favor storage of calories uh, as fat, and the permissive environmental factor that will lead to express this genetic background is available now more globally, in, uh, globally available, the environmental confounders, the environmental factors that will lead to obesity. And when you try to explain what happened in the last two decades, that it's a much environmental changes that provide uh, uh, or contribute to the obesity etiology, and you might find the genetic background if you find some, uh, some child is resistant to the management with the usual ways. So at that time, you might realize that genetic background might play uh, more role. So other contributing factors for, like the diet, the high calorie diet, which is everywhere now, fast food, uh, fries, uh, vending machine everywhere. Even in the hospital, we have a lot of vending machines. And soft drinks and sweets, these bad diets or unhealthy diets will contribute to obesity hand in hand with a lack of physical activity or inactivity that is very uh, uh, prevalent now uh, through watching TV, playing over the internet, PlayStation, smartphones, and there is no uh, outdoor activity. And even in the hot weather, if I cannot find the outdoor activity, I should provide indoor activity to enhance the physical activity. The socioeconomic status is a contributing factor. Actually, the lower the socioeconomic status, the higher the obesity uh, uh, prevalence. And this is why maybe the healthy food could be a little bit expensive and regular checkup at the doctors might be a little bit expensive and not 
available. And the regular checkup is a very important preventive point in the management we'll talk about to detect earlier the, imb the impending overweight or obesity to tackle the problem and prevent it from the start. So the levels of obesity are the levels of prevention. The levels of factors that lead to obesity are the levels of prevention, and these levels are internationally, nationally, local, at the community and locality, and at the many community of work or school. And then all of this will lead to a balance between energy expenditure versus food intake. And the way of this balance will lead to, at the end, either obese or underweight or normal weight. And the same levels should be tackled at the management plan. What are the consequences and comorbidities of obesity? A lot of consequences. The most famous one is the glycemic abnormality and so resistance and the end with the type 2 diabetes. Cardiovascular, hypertension, dyslipidemia, non-alcoholic uh, fatty, uh, non, uh, uh, fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis, orthopedic problems, skin problems, menstrual disturbances, and the most imp important, the psychological impact of obesity over the child, like low self-esteem and uh, negative body image, depression, social stigma. And these, we should pay attention for that, and we should, we should encourage the parents to pay attention to these points, and we should uh, learn the, par the parents to help obese children feel loved, and to increase and build up the child's self-esteem, and uh, don't, and the, patient, the parents should be very sensitive for the child not to take their concerns as insult. They are caring for him, they are not insulting him or her. Type 2 diabetes, when to screen? I have to screen when there is an overweight by definition and two risk factors like positive family history of type 2 diabetes with, uh, in the first or second degree and some race or ethnic groups and signs of insulin resistance like the famous Akansos negricans. So if I have two criteria plus obesity, I have to screen. When to screen? Af after the age of 10 years, every two years, they choose in the ADA the fasting blood glucose level or fasting plasma glucose, but actually this is a very debatable point because the fasting blood glucose is a very late rather than the impaired glucose tolerance might be detected by the oral glucose tolerance test and the continuous glucose monitoring uh, machine, which is a new device that can detect uh, blood glucose every five minutes for the whole day. And recently, we conducted in our department a uh, study, it's accepted for publication, a pilot study to compare the oral glucose tolerance versus the continuous glucose monitoring system in obese children, and we found that the CGMS is superior in detection of the glycemic abnormalities than the OGTT, but we are still stuck to the standard, uh, standard in diagnosing the pre-diabetes and diabetes state, uh, which is uh, the OGTT. The decision for the treatment for type 2 diabetes in children is a level 1 lifestyle, but not alone. Lifestyle modification and competing obesity plus metformin, which is the only FDA approved uh, uh, oral hypoglycemic used, uh, 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 oral drug used in children. And then if no control, we might add a basal insulin like glargin or detimir. And then if no proper control, we can use a full insulin regimen for uh, obese children. and. Uh, we should monitor for a lot of comorbidities with the type 2 diabetes like hypertension, fatty liver, BCO, polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, dyslipidemia, and sleep apnea. So what, are the man what is the management for obesity? I have the cornerstone of the management is prevention. We all, all of us know the lines of prevention, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And primary prevention is the best here. I should. Uh, make the setting of an environment doesn't lead to obesity and should be a national project, a national objective or goal to compete obesity from the start. A lot of issues should be there uh, to compete with, the, uh, to prevent the obesity from the start. And a lot of behavior change should be there and should be, uh, 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 the media should contribute to that. And the outcome of this objective will be First, prevent obesity, and if it is there, prevent more weight gain. And if the weight gain is very high, you should lose 
weight gain, and when you lose this weight, you should prevent regain of weight. These are the levels you should act on. And we have a lot of preventing factors, like the prenatal support we found from the last lecture, how the prenatal life might affect the long-term long obesity in childhood. Encouragement of breastfeeding for month, more than six months, the, the first six months, and delay the entry of solid foods. All of these factors found to have a share in the obesity at the long run and uh, good nutritional education, physical activity, and regular checkup to early detect obesity in childhood. And the treatment will constitute diet changes, behavior modification, physical activity, medication, plus or minus surgery. So diet should be in a growing child. He's obese, but growing, and he needs some nutrients. So it should be balanced. Balanced, but high bucaloric diet. And I might maintain weight rather than lose weight in some ages. And when he is growing up, this will be passively as if he is losing weight. And in others with comorbidity, I might find I might need to uh, make some weight loss. And uh, the behavior modification is the cornerstone in the diet treatment. Behavior modification like not eating in front of TV. Because there is no satiety center while you are eating. So you are eating, you are filling. Uh, 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 as your stomach rather than eating. So it shouldn't be, you shouldn't eat in front of TV, in front of the computer. You shouldn't snack in between meals, unhealthy snacks. You might get, get some vegetables, but not snacking and fries and, uh, and uh, junk foods. It, it, the bites should be small. It shouldn't use uh, food for rewarding. You should encourage physical activity. You should be a good example for your child in eating good, uh, healthy foods. So these are um, uh, behavior modification, very effective in childhood obesity rather than the diet per se or physical activity itself. Physical activity should be encouraged and uh, again parents should be a good example for their children and should share their children the physical activity if they have enough time, but they should uh, find some hour for that and you should limit the screen playing the, from the PlayStation to the TV to the Internet and now the smartphones, so you should limit this time to encourage more time for physical activity. For the medication, we don't have FDA-approved medication, a lot of FDA-approved medication in childhood obesity, and uh, we don't encourage medication. Medication might be there to facilitate adherence to the other lines of treatment, the diet and behavior modification and physical activity for a short time and then stop it and make the child adherent to the same lines of treatment. But it shouldn't be on the long term and should be for a short time. And lastly, the weight loss surgery. You should weigh the risk benefit for this. If it's a severe morbid obesity with comorbidities, you might weigh the risk benefit and you might ask for this. But this should be the last option after uh, uh, doing all the lines of treatment and uh, it, you should weigh the risk benefit for, uh, for this. The, again, the primary prevention and the national project to compete with obesity and to prevent obesity and you should make the setting, the good environment to prevent obesity is the cornerstone to prevent and prevent the comorbidities and the adulthood obesity in children. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, lecture, with which and thank you for the focusing on prevention and treatment and the primary prevention, not the last yeah. point, the surgery. That's uh, real last. Uh, choice. Uh, I think we will not discuss now because we'll do it later because it's excellent uh, possible to go to take over the uh, next speaker. Thank you for Thank your you. lecture. And I wish to ask uh, Dr. El Bartella uh, to speak about uh, the psychological and social possibilities in, in prevention and treatment of obesity. Uh, Dr. Bartella is uh, Altani professor of communication, professor of psychology, and professor of human development and social policy in the Northwestern University in Illinois. Please tell us about your experience. So let's see if I can do this. First, thank you so much for inviting me here this evening. 
Dr. Alawa uh, actually teed up my conversation and what I'd like to talk to you about by focusing on uh, some of the environmental factors that influence childhood obesity. In the last 10 years in the United States, we've become increasingly aware of the obesity crisis. And what I'd like to talk about is some of the research that's been done um, around the issue of food marketing. Um, some of the research evidence from two of the 11 reports that have come out in the last 10 years about childhood obesity and the obesity crisis. One from 2006 on food marketing especially and its, its contributions to childhood obesity. Uh, and another report that just came out in May of this year called Advancing Progress in Obesity Prevention. And then I want to talk about some proposals that are sitting right now in the White House to establish nutritional standards uh, for what can be marketed to children in the US. And then talk a little bit about uh, the Qatar situation and uh, make a modest proposal um, for looking at some of these environmental factors. Let's talk a little bit first about the nature of what marketing is. Marketing involves conducting research, defining the target market, analyzing the competition, implementing basic processes that constitute the marketing mix and drivers, and it involves what are typically known among marketers as the four P's, product, place, price, and promotion. Um, it is the case that when we talk about marketing, we have to talk today especially about the many venues in which marketing takes place. Certainly in the United States, there's marketing in schools, um, in cafeterias and the little swish signs that children have on, on their exercise outfits for the school uniforms. There's marketing in malls, theaters, sporting events, childcare settings. And there are many, many vehicles, uh, broadcast, print, web, video games, push advertising on cell phones, um, the marketing that you see out on the, the roads in these huge uh, displays. And in the US, in, in addition, there's also school-based marketing practices, product sales, direct and indirect advertising. All of these um, are strategies that have been aimed at youth over the last, oh, 30 to 40 years. When we began um, studying in the United States food marketing and its contributions to the childhood obesity crisis, one of the things that we noticed is that in conjunction with the increase in marketing of different kinds of foods to children was an, in a change in the nature of the uh, trends in diet and eating patterns. And I'm going to be drawing specifically from the 2006 Institute of Medicine report on food marketing and its contributions to childhood obesity. In the American diet for children and youth, uh, children are now eating higher than recommended sugar, sodium, total and saturated fats, they have inadequate uh, intakes of whole grains, fruits, milk, vegetables, potassium, fiber, magnesium, and vitamin E, and a general increase in calories, carbohydrates, sweetened beverage consumption, and that's, if there's one thing that we were, were trying to change in the US, it's sweetened beverage consumption, which contributes in excess of about 150 calories a day to the average American use diet, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and the goal here is to look at the relationship between marketing and these dietary patterns. In that 2006 Institute of Medicine study which first looked at food marketing, uh, we conducted, and I was a member of the panel that did that study, we conducted um, an evidence review to look at what the relationship is between marketing practices and children's food preferences, food choices, and actual eating patterns. We reviewed over 123 studies that had been conducted up to that point um, that met the standards of evidence review, which meant that we could actually judge the quality of the research and the power that could be uh, assigned to the, uh, the analysis that was conducted. Um, we scoured the uh, US and all the English-speaking literature, and um, we examined specifically, and most specifically, TV advertising, because at that point in 2006, 2005, there wasn't a lot of research on other kinds of marketing practices even though I talked about in-store promotion on package marketing, it was really research on TV advertising. That evidence review was rather consistent in what it found. We found strong evidence <coughs> of effects on food and beverage preferences by advertising. Children's purchase requests and their short-term and food and beverage consumption among two and 11 year olds. We found insufficient evidence to say that there was a strong relationship among, to among the adolescents, 12 to 18 year olds. And that was primarily because we didn't find enough studies. There were only a handful at that point. We found moderate evidence of effects 
on food and beverage beliefs and the usual dietary intake of two to five-year-olds. And we, as I said, found insufficient evidence to call a relationship between um, what adolescents are choosing to eat and their exposure to, in this case, television advertising, because we had so few studies. But the evidence was strong enough for us to conclude that food marketing is indeed, and particularly television advertising, is indeed an influential part of factor in the childhood obesity crisis. That study was followed up by two other studies, but I specifically want to talk about the report that just came out of the Institute of Medicine this past May, which is a report uh, that was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to look at how we can accelerate progress on obesity prevention. And that report um, concluded that there are five goals that must be met if we're going to make some headway in looking at the environmental um, factors which influence obesity. First, the recommendation is to integrate physical activity every day in every way in children and adult lives. And this includes such things as uh, enhancing the physical and built environment so that children can walk more than they do and adults can walk as well and provide a whole variety of support mechanisms for uh, community um, practices of physical activity. And also in the United States con context to provide more research on physical activity, which has been understudied to a large extent. Secondly, to make healthy foods available everywhere. And that means that uh, we want to have healthy food choices, the easy option, whether you go to a restaurant or you go to um, a movie theater or you go into the schools, wherever food is being sold, that there are healthy options for those foods. I'm going to come back to the marketing issue in a second. That we have to activate employers and healthcare professionals in new ways to get them interested in ensuring that concern about obesity and nutrition and physical exercise are high on the list of issues that are attended to in the schools, um, at workplaces, and by the healthcare professionals. And especially in the United States, where many of our children are getting some meals in the schools, to strengthen the schools as the heart of the health issues by adopting strong nutrition education standards and providing healthy, healthy um, uh, food options and beverage options. We talked about the use of vending machines. A number of communities, and our, our schools are, are controlled at the local level, a number of communities today are taking sweetened beverages out of the, the vending machines and putting water and more milk and requiring <laughs> that children uh, change their beverage consumption. In addition, there were some very specific recommendations about uh, food marketing. That the number one thing that we can do is to reduce the overconsumption of sugar sweetened beverages. You might know that just in the last month, the mayor of New York, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, has uh, declared that you can no longer sell sweetened beverages in containers larger than 16 ounces. He's been called the American nanny for doing that. But that's an attempt that's also being repeated across the country, either reducing the size of, of the portions of sweetened sugar beverages or actually taxing sweetened sugar beverages. We uh, recommend, again, the availability of lower calorie, calorie and healthier food and beverage options for children in restaurants, specifically fast food restaurants where they have children's meals, where the default option should be that you get milk rather than a sweetened drink. Uh, where you have apple slices rather than french fries and other uh, stronger standards for strong nutrition. Implementing common nutritional standards for marketing foods and beverages to children, I want to talk about that more. There's been a proposal around in the United States since 2009, and I'll talk about what these nutritional standards are. And to ensure consistent nutrition labeling for the front of packages. Um, uh, this is a recommendation that just came out this past and a recommendation that all packaged foods in the United States should carry a common logo on the front with information about the calories per serving and the amount and whether it meets acceptable standards on fats, sugar, and salt. And that proposal sits with the Food and Drug Administration and USDA right now. This is both to alert um, consumers on what are the healthier choices, but also, if you think about it psychologically, um, competing brands are going to, will want to get good scores on the front of packages. And so we fully expect that there will be product reformulation, which will be healthier for all Americans, whether they use this information or not. 
the most important recommendation that's been around, as I said, since 2009, was developed by uh, an interagency working group on proposed nutritional standards for all foods that would be marketed to children in the US. And these would begin as voluntary standards and then possibly could become regulated. Uh, the point is that by 2016, foods most heavily marketed to children in the US should meet two basic nutritional principles. And these are the foods that we're talking about. Principle A, that foods marketed to children should provide a meaningful contribution to a healthful diet, and that means fruit, vegetable, whole grain. Or principle B, that they should minimize nutrients with negative impact on health, and that foods marketed should not contain more than a certain amount of fats, sugars, and sodium. This recommendation has been sitting uh, in the White House since uh, the fall. I fully expect that nothing will happen on it until after the American presidential election, um, partly because the American Beverage Association, the American food and beverage industry, has really come out with great concerns about the growth of interest in somehow regulating food marketing practices. Um, and that in <coughs> itself has raised the awareness of the American public about uh, childhood obesity and food marketing's contributions. I also would like to make a very modest proposal here that many of the issues that um, Qatar is facing and which we are facing in the United States um, could be discussed at a research roundtable with representatives from both countries to develop a research agenda on these environmental influences on obesity prevention. And I, for one, think that these environmental influences are uh, quite important where young children are concerned because we know of the power of the media. And with that, I say thank you.